Hey guys, and good morning. I am Yo Armanderis, and I am from Southern California. I'm here with Julie Fryman, and we are here to present uh, our puppy workshop. So if you just got a new puppy or you are planning on getting a puppy, this is going to be a great workshop specifically for puppies 8 to 20 weeks. So before you bring your puppy home or around uh, 8 to 20 weeks. So, hey, Julie, how you doing? I'm good. I was having a little trouble logging in, but tech issues aside, I'm very excited to be here because puppies are my favorite topic, of course. Awesome. So let's just confirm if you can do me a big favor and go into one of the groups. I think we are streaming live into four or five different groups. So if you can check to make sure that we are going live, perfect. That's the thumbs up. So your presentation today is all around puppy, the puppy schedule, the puppy routine. Awesome. Julie, I'm going to have you uh, just welcome everyone, find out where everyone is from, if anyone is listening, or just let us know a little bit about why you like working with puppies as I put together, put that presentation up. Absolutely. So um, if you are joining us in one of the Facebook groups, go ahead and comment below. Tell us about your puppies. Tell us about how old they are, what their breeds are, where you guys are located. It's just fun to make that new puppy community as wide and as expansive as we can. Um, I love the opportunity to work with puppies this age because we have a huge window of influence for the dog that you're going to have for the rest of your life or for the rest of their life. So for the next 10 to 15 years, you get the opportunity to have a dog that you've always dreamed of when you have the puppy uh, below 20 weeks. We can socialize, we can expose, we can do field trips, we can do all of these awesome things to build the kind of life that you're looking forward to instead of just looking at the next couple of months. Beautiful. Uh, let me know if you can see this presentation. Julie. I'm pretty sure you can. So raising a well-mannered Aussie doodle puppy, it's not just for Aussie doodles. It is for any kind of puppy. Now I put together an Aussie doodle presentation because I'm streaming live into the Aussie doodle group. Um, this is my dog on the left, Bentley. He is a standard Aussie doodle. He's about 65 pounds. And the top right-hand corner is Jackie Daniels, JD. We also have her sister, Mia, and her sister, Winnie, that are all part of, um, they all came together from a, from a breeder and they came over and they're in three different homes. So I've gotten a chance to work with lots of different Aussie doodles. So workshop rules, just pretty much letting you know that we are streaming directly into your group. So you can definitely watch this later. We're also going to have it on our YouTube link. So just in case you've got to run, do us a favor and type hashtag replay in your Facebook group. If you're watching this right now live, you can actually comment and we can see your comments as they go. So if you can use the comments below, just put hashtag replay. If you're watching this later, we'll come back around and welcome you. Or if, you, um, if you'd if you like to ask questions as we go, you can definitely ask questions and we'll be able to pull those up later. So let me see if Julie's back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, Julie, when I share, I'm going to be, um, let me see, video, let's see. Let me do that again. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Sorry, I was it asked it prompt the computer prompted me. You know, I'm I'm not so good with all of this stuff. So um, you're doing if, fine. If so you're I the presentation, I'm gonna be reading the comments so that way if we have any uh, relevant comments that are going on about puppy questions on whatever topic we're talking about, I'm gonna just kind of cut in and help. hopefully we can answer them together. Does that sound good? Perfect. So I'll kind of flip through the presentation that we have. It's gonna be short and sweet and right straight to the point. I can't see the question, so that will be fantastic if you can support. Yeah. So when, it, when you come to bringing home a puppy or you're getting a puppy or thinking about getting a puppy, 
there's lots of different steps it's going to take to actually develop the puppy the way that you see. So what I would like to first find out is whether you are getting this puppy because you need a companion dog or is it going to be a walking buddy? So before you, and I mean, ideally before you bring your puppy home, you've got some thoughts of what this might look like. Um, is this going to be a dog that you're going to go and compete in sports? Is it a hunting dog, a, just a family pet that the family gets to be involved in the whole process or just having that companion there? Therapy or service animal. So before you go into figuring out what type of training you're going to do, what type of management, um, how the reinforcement is all going to work, you're going to want to have a little thought about what you plan on doing with your dog. And from there, highly recommend if you have not purchased your puppy yet and you haven't gotten your puppy, like you're waiting for him to really look at the breed that you're about to bring home or the breed that you currently have. And that's going to tell you a lot about what the dog is programmed to do, right? You want to add on to that, Julie? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, working dogs, it takes a, a quite a bit of energy as well as, you know, uh, energy from the owners and intelligence. It may be a more challenging breed. So there's a lot of information online. Not all of it is good, but see what your friends and family say when you say, I'm getting an Aussie. If they all look really shocked, um, maybe that's not the best breed for you and your lifestyle, but we can always go through that with you. If you reach out to us, we help pick the perfect puppy and the perfect breed for your lifestyle and your family. So that's another service that we offer that's separate from this workshop. Yeah. And I just want to like touch bases with the Aussie Doodle specifically. If you think about the Australian Shepherd and the Poodle, go look and see what they're bred to do. And then um, each breeder that you work with, all the breeders are going to have different types of Aussies. They have working Aussies. They have Aussies that have lived in the home and they've got Aussies that work on the farm. And that's going to determine that genetic is going to come down to the puppies that you um, are going to be receiving from that breeder. So be mindful. If you're thinking about having a dog that just chills out at your feet and you don't have a lot of energy that, that it might take to creating that with your puppy, then you're going to probably need to look for outside sources to give you some help, whether that's daycare, where they're having a trainer come over. Uh, so really keep that in mind when you're choosing a puppy or the dog that you currently have right now, and you're trying to think about what you'd like to do, you want to, you want it to be naturally fun for the pup, right? So when you're choosing um, a dog between like an Aussie or a um, let's say golden doodle or an Aussie doodle or a labradoodle. You just want to kind of be mindful of all of that. Yeah. Personalities play a big role in how we uh, exercise and how we enrich our dog's lives. So the general uh, instincts of the dogs are similar, but the personality of each puppy in each litter is going to be a little different. So it's also important to know what you're looking for if you are going to a breeder, if you are starting to ask those questions, um, which of the puppies in the litter run to the toy first, which of them are kind of hanging back and hanging out with the people. Do they like being cuddled or, or are they more um, play focused? All of these things help us really determine what we're going to steer that puppy into to help make sure that they're motivated and engaged and they're bonding well with you. Beautiful. All right. You still able to see this? Yeah. Just fine. Right. Okay. Moving on to today, what we're going to just jump in and talk about is the puppy essentials, the three top puppy needs, what shapes behavior. And Julie, I'll let you take over. Creating a safe for your puppy, especially um, the puppy developmental stages and having a, the puppy schedule and routine. The most important thing is the, that schedule and the routine preventing unwanted behavior. So starting to think of the older dogs that you guys see that you're like, oh, maybe I really don't want the dog that jumps on the counter and counter serves. I really don't want the dog that barks at the door all the time, right? Um, I really don't want a dog who is needy and has to follow me to the bathroom every moment of the day. So 
understanding how we can prevent those things, separation anxiety, attention seeking behaviors, we can start all of that and set our young puppies up for success and make sure that we don't have to deal with those sometimes very expensive or dangerous unwanted behaviors. And then what our company, what we as trainers can do to help you in this puppy process. You're on mute, dear. There we go. There we go. Okay. So puppy essentials is so here's some of the basic things that you're going to want to have before you bring your pup home, or if you haven't gone to do this already and your dog is home um, in your house, then you want to make sure you kind of understand what they might be useful for. So a safe space basically means where are you going to be hosting your pup while you're have to go to the bathroom or go take a shower. So that could be a crate. It could be an X pen. It could be a room. You want to make sure that that space is set aside for your dog. And it's out of the way for the people in your home. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Interactive feeders, water bowls. Um, I have a lot of Aussie doodles that pick up their water bowl with their mouth and they carry it around. So being mindful of where that water bowl is and maybe what kind, whether it's ceramic, stainless steel. Uh, we, re we don't recommend plastic water bowls. Just get something where it can stay put. And where you place your water bowl is going to be really important. We'll talk about that later. Management tools, X-Pens, puppy gates, uh, leashes, right? Leashes. Harnesses. Uh, crates, uh, you know, even extra curtains or blinds, covers so that you can kind of darken the space while they're sleeping. Absolutely. You're going to want to have some of your dog's puppy food that came from the breeder or the rescue, wherever you're getting your dog from. You want to make sure you have some of that because the transition into another food needs to be gradual so that your dog's tummy doesn't get really upset. And as far as treats go, you typically just to keep an eye on the on your pup's tummy. You want to be you want to like not go into buying twenty different things. If you're going to pick a treat, pick something that's really high quality, and we recommend using the same protein source as your pup food. So if your dog is on chicken and some kind of chicken kibble or chicken food, you know, food, then get chicken treats and try to keep it to one protein source at the beginning. And then gradually adding different, um, different types of food, different treats. Um, Especially for those doodles, they tend to have sensitivities towards certain kind of protein. So if you're in one of our doodle groups, just having that one protein at a time can really help with the transitions. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and finish off the uh, potty station enzyme cleaner. Enzyme cleaner. I already have that right here. I just noticed I had it right here on the table. So enzyme cleaner, you're going to need this. Like learn it, love it, use it, live by it. Um, your vet check, most important, especially if your dog is coming straight from the breeder or a rescue, um, you want to have your own vet check and make sure that things are all on the up and up because a lot of breeders do come with health guarantees. So we want to make sure to get that in as soon as possible. Grooming supplies. If your dog is a doodle or any kind of long haired dog, we're going to talk about grooming, uh, brushing their teeth, nails, all of those things, toys and shoes. There are a lot of different kinds of toys and there are puppy safe chews. We're going to talk to you a little bit about what uh, the purpose of the mouthing is and why it's so important to have that stuff around the house so that you don't end up bloody and, and scarred. And then a harness collar and leash. This is especially while you're potty training because if you, it's going to take you time to take the puppy out get stuff on, get the leash, take them outside. Guess what? They're probably going to potty on your shoes. So having all of that stuff ready and prepared in a specific place or yeah. like on the door ready to go is exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. Even on the X-Pen, I'll like sometimes put the leashes right there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the puppies will keep the harness on like a really soft, meshy kind of harness because um, it's just easier to transport your dog from from back to the potty station since they're going out quite frequently at the beginning. Collars, you know, you, you want to get a collar with your dog's name on it, but not necessarily have it put on all the time. 
Uh, you do want to make sure that you have access to it just in case, especially if there's any way or chance that your dog can get out. So, um, but not leaving them alone with their collar on um, can be dangerous sometimes in the crate. All right, let's move on. All right, so if we really, if we had to say, what are their top three things that every puppy needs, like right off the bat, Julie, I'll, I'll go over and then I just want you to add on to this and then let me know if, if you agree. So number one is creating safety. Dog needs to feel like they're safe. Uh, and, and that can be, um, and we'll go into ex explaining what that might be or how to do it. Number two, establish the routine before you even bring your puppy home, or if you've got your pup home now, is really be consistent on that routine, whatever that routine is. And then number three is then you begin to build trust and a really good connection with your puppy. So how do you, how do you feel about those, my top three tips? Oh my gosh, yes. From day one, routine, routine, routine is my favorite of those three because um, Yo and I like to say we have a magic formula. When the puppies come over to our house, we are schedule, uh, you know, controllers. We we love that on the list, making sure, but also being patient and understanding that this is a whole new world. It can be very scary being ripped away from your mom and brothers and sisters. So we want to make sure that our puppies aren't overwhelmed. We're not moving too fast. We're we're finding what works for that individual puppy because. Even puppies from the same litter have yeah. different motivations, have different stress levels, and have different comfort levels with both people and other animals. So we don't have the same thing that we do for each puppy. Yeah. So if we go about how do we create safety, be, be very patient with your pup. Go really slow and prevent overwhelm. What that means is not inviting 20 people over to your house to check out your puppy or bringing your pup into a group of your kid's school and having 25 children all around that's that can that can really lead to overwhelm and you want to make sure you listen so how do you listen to a puppy they're going to give you some specific cues you're going to be able to read their body body language and understand how they're feeling so for a puppy let's um let me ask you julie what are some of the ways you know when a dog is under stress Oh gosh. So a lot of times there, it's almost like their ears just turn off. It doesn't matter what noise you're making. You can make kissing noises. You can say their name over and over. It's really not going to matter because they're going to start avoiding you or that stressful experience. It's like, I don't even want to deal with this. So it's not even running away. It's just kind of forgetting that you're there. Or I don't really want to know that mom and dad are around. Um, especially being mouthy, those young puppies, when they get overstimulated, you're going to have some big time bites and mouthy, um, maybe even crying and wiggling, especially when they're in the arms. And all of that can get really dangerous really quickly, right? If they wiggle and they fall out of your arms, that's a big, big vet bill. Trust us, we know. And so we <laughs> want to go at our puppy's speed so that we don't increase the stress or increase the potential for a dangerous situation. Beautiful. And number two, establishing routine. All that is, is be very consistent. Going out the same door, right, each time. Limit the amount of space that your puppy has so that they can establish that routine with the space that's been given. Reward How often do we walk into a house and the puppy just greets us at the front door? <laughs> yeah. So Absolutely. making sure that you're giving your puppy puppy space, not human space, not the entire house the day they come home, but giving them limited space is setting them up for success. So don't feel bad that they only have one little corner because you're going to make that corner Disneyland. Right. So just keep that in mind as we go yeah. through the schedule and the routine, limiting the space is your key to success. And opening it up, um, you'll progress at a rate where your dog will tell you, like when they're not they're not having accidents. Uh, you've got so you've got the potty routine down. Then you can start to open up. 
uh, reward any behaviors that you love. A lot of times we find that pet parents only vocalize when the dog is doing something that they don't want them to do. So reward everything that you can possibly imagine that you love your dog doing, which is typically any calm behavior from a puppy. Sit uh, down, um, coming over and accepting petting, maybe nudging you with their nose. Those are all things that you want to reward. Even coming over and eating from your hand is something that you want to reward. Learn to understand the body language. You talked about that a little bit earlier, but just understanding, reading your dog's body language. And then tip number three, um, I would say building trust and connection. So right off the bat, like right when you bring your puppy home, you're, you know, creating that safe space, you're establishing a routine, and then you want to start building a relationship with your pup so that when you ask your dog to do something, you cue them. They, and if they know what you're saying, know what that signal means, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. So hand feeding is a really easy way to establish that routine. We find so many puppy pet parents use their hands to remove something from a dog's mouth, right? Or for little dogs, they pick them up all the time. And so the puppies learn that your hands are one, like these fast moving objects that they can't <laughs> avoid. And who knows what's going to happen when they come near you. So hand feeding is a really intimate way to make sure that your puppies are comfortable looking at you, looking in your eyes, eating from your hands, developing that um, relationship, that bonding, just like you would with a young kid, right? Yeah. You don't have to feed a kid from your hand, but you do make a big effort of airplane noises yeah. and trains and all of those things that make that kind of uh, thing, a connection, a fun thing to do together. Yeah. Um, move at your puppy's level. So what that means is like, let's say you've got a, a, a brand new pup and they are not feeding from your hand. They've just never, never experienced that. And you could tell they're maybe backing up. Then you could possibly just place the food closer to them. And they, they see it coming from your hand. That would be a way to progress to eventually hand feeding. So you want to progress at your dog's level. Move very slow have a lot of fun, be joyful, and make sure that your dog has an outlet. That is a really, really fast way to connect with your dog. If you are the person that's bringing an interactive feeder or bringing a snuffle ball or a tennis ball or frisbee, whatever it is, it's coming from you, you become the source of all fun things, right? Yeah. And it even if it's difficult getting down on your puppy's level, I know even if you have neck or back issues, even bringing them up a little bit towards you because mm. the world is very scary when you're on the floor and everyone is big and leaning over you. So just make sure that you're also spending some time at your puppy's level. So we talk about what shapes behavior. It's really simple. When a dog experiences something, they decide, is that safe? Or is that dangerous? That is all that's going through their head. And safe would mean a dog goes over, they sniff it, and they go, ah, no big deal. Dangerous, they go over to a statue, and all of a sudden the statue moves, and they back up. Now we've got a pup that is afraid of whatever that is, whether it's a vacuum cleaner, a, a broom, anything that's new in the dog's world, they are making that decision. They're going safe or unsafe, right? Dangerous or safe. And then the other thing that's going on in their, in their minds is, did that work or does that not work? I have a really uh, fast example. I'll, I'll, I'll go over a little short story about that. And then I'm going to have you add on to this, Julie. So I had a pup here. God, what was that? She was here for a board and train. It was months ago. And I put her in the crate and she was in the crate and she was really quiet. And I was like, oh, she's doing fantastic day one. Yes, good. And um, I went to go take a shower. And when I came back up and I usually in the crates, I cover them up. I've got music playing. So it's a very like relaxing place is what the goal is. And when I came upstairs, um, she greeted me. Yeah. At the at the pet gate. And I was like, huh, how did you get out? 
And um, so, uh, you know, later on, I put her back in the crate. And what I, when I sat there and listened, what she was doing is she was using her paw to hit the crate door over and over, which is a button that, you know, she just happened to hit it right. And she figured out how to get out of the crate. And you think about it, they, she tried something to see if it worked. Now, had it never worked, she would have never done it again. Right. So we think about like counter surfing or alert barking, right? When they're trying to uh, demand the attention and they're barking at you. The puppy's trying something to see if it works. If you put a dog in a crate and they're screaming and they're crying, you know that they're trying to get your attention or they're telling you, I feel unsafe. But the moment you go over and the timing is not perfect, if you go over at the moment while the dog is alerting to you, you become, you, the dog learns, oh, that's how I get her attention. So add on a little bit to that, Julie. Oh, yeah. Puppies try everything. Puppies try everything. And a lot of it has to do with their mouth. So... We, uh, you know, the puppy bites you. The old school way we used to say, ouch, and then move away from our puppies. But mm. if you have a high drive puppy and you say, ouch, when they bite you, you just became their new favorite squeaker squeak toy. Yep. Like, oh my God, mom speaks like my toys. That's so much fun. And so they're going to bite and bite harder and harder until they get the result that they originally got. And I understand puppies bite hard and it can really, they can puncture the skin. Trust me, I know. However, it's just like a baby hitting you. I know that it hurts, but they certainly don't mean it that way. So we get to hold it in and be as gentle as possible and try to redirect, disengage, put them in a safer area, and then evaluate what we're doing as people. What made them want to bite? Was it frustration or attention? Are they hungry? Do they need to go outside? And all of these things are them communicating. So they're thinking it works or it doesn't work. And that's how they see the entire world. It's us humans who love to live in the gray. We're very, well, maybe, I don't know, sometimes I'll be there around. Puppies don't work like that. It works or it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work anymore, they're either going to try even harder right. or they're going to stop altogether. And so we get to help develop where that line is. Yeah, this works specifically like really well with puppies where you can ignore because they're figuring it out. Now, when you get into the adolescent dog, now we're going into a totally different subject. That means that they've tried this a lot of repetitions and now they've discovered that this does work. And there's a whole behavior modification plan for that. So we're talking specifically about puppies when you first bring them home between eight and 20 weeks. And we're going to talk about the different stages in... Did we skip the stages? Maybe we did. No, I think it's next. Okay, perfect. All right. So a safe space is a place where you can leave your puppy and they're they're feeling comfortable being left alone, right? And we're going to do this right off the bat, right when you bring your pup home, is we got to get the puppy into a place where they feel comfortable. That can be a crate. That can be an X-Pen. It just needs to be a place that feels safe. How do you make it safe? Well, you sit in there with them. If you're in an X pen, you sit in there and you do the training. You sit on the floor and you and you you be the host of fun, right? And that's how you can make that place safe. So it keeps your dog safe and it keeps people in the house safe. So when someone says, "Oh, my dog keeps biting me," they can be in their little safe space to prevent your dog from putting their mouth on you over and over. If you've got children, same thing. Anything else you want to add to that? No, absolutely not. And it's not just keeping uh, your, you know, the puppy safe, but it's also keeping you and your things safe. And it's so much yeah. less expensive and less dangerous to have an initial spot where your stuff is out of the way and it's not going to be ingested or, you know, hurt the puppy. And we've had those cases as well. And when you're 
Deciding where to put your dog in their area, you want a place where they feel safe. So in the middle of a living room, not so much because you've got all their sides. They've got stimulus going from all the different sides. They can't really get that good rest. Typically in the corner of a living room, right? In an area where maybe you can see them, you know, from afar, or maybe you're in an office and you've got them in a corner. Think about the process. So you've got this X pen up, you've got a crate, you've got an X pen, and eventually that X pen is going to disappear. And maybe that's where you put your dog's bed and that's where they get to hang out. Where is your pup going to go when you're off to the movies or your whole family's out to dinner? Where is that space? So think about where that is now and what do you want it to be in the future? And that's gonna help determine like where that is. All right, any questions on that? No, not so far, we don't have any questions, but I'm waiting guys, go ahead and post and comment uh, whatever questions you have during this time because this is a perfect opportunity. I promise if you have that question, a lot of other people do as well. All right, moving on to developmental stages, Julie. So let's go over all the different stages and then just really quickly the stage that we're specifically talking about right now. Yeah, so the prenatal, this is um, everything inside mom, mom's stress, mom's nutrition, the environment that they grew up in, a lot of that neonatal, Puppies are born blind and deaf, so it's in the first few days that their eyes start to open and their ears start to open, and it's so adorable. Um, the transitional stage, this is where you're probably going to get photos at, from your breeder or videos where the puppies are starting to hop around in the environment. They're starting to notice light and sound. Socialization, I'm going to go really deep into this one in just a second. Juvenile, this is um, mm. the toddler <laughs> age. This is where we get lots of mouthing and barking, and barking, and they're starting to put their paws on things. Um, adolescent, this is our teenage, our terrible teenagers. No, I'm just kidding. They are just hormonal and they're emotional, and they're, you know, we have a whole class. So if you know someone or if you are someone with an adolescent puppy, please join us for another class because um, there's so much that goes on during this time between six months and two years, sometimes three, four, five years, depending on the breed. Um, we consider a dog adult when they hit social maturity. So when they're able to chill out with other dogs or in, in the environment that you live in, right? That's when your dog is technically considered an adult. And then our senior dogs, depending on the breed, most senior dogs are considered seven years and older. But today we are here to talk about our socialization period. And this can be one of the most critical periods in your puppy's life. If you've done the work of the behind the scenes, we maybe talked to the breeder or the rescue where we knew where the puppy was coming from, there's the opportunity to expose them before they even come home. But when you guys get them home, the most dangerous thing that you can do is to keep them away from everything and never take them outside. Yep. And I understand that your vet is very adamant about not taking them out until they're fully vaccinated. However, there are safe and positive ways that we can socialize our puppy that have nothing to do with touching anything right. dangerous. Yep. Or the or the ground. Yeah. So this is where your puppy's personality and temperament is evolving. This is how they're going to handle changes and, and different experiences and travel and new people. We have the opportunity to influence our dog's reactions during the socialization time. So it's introducing them to the world, well, not just to the world, but to your world, to the world that you're going to create with your puppy. Love it. All right, so let's dive deep into the puppy schedule and routine. We will have, if you would like to have a PDF of a puppy schedule that we have like in our board and train uh, with our board and train pups, just comment below and we will send you one on Messenger. Since we're on Facebook right now, you could just uh, send it, uh, send us a little message on here and we will send it to you. 
So puppy schedule routine, we talked about making sure that you're on routine and you're developing a routine that works for your family, works for your dog, and it just keeps your dog on routine and they get to establish what comes next, right? And it really is the fastest way to train a pup. So potty routine, you've got your physical exercise, right? Which could be your play. And you got your socialization also in that phase right there. Number two, three, mental exercise and training. This usually has to do with their meal time, then potty, and then alone time. So this is typically the five steps that we go into. Two and three, usually you choose one, go back to potty, and then your dog is left alone. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So that's repeated three or four times a day. So let me exit out of here. And I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I'm going to share a typical routine instead. Yes. This is the PDF that we have for you. If you'd like to get a copy of it again, just uh, let us know. All right. So this is a typical puppy schedule during the day and then the evening it's based on the puppy's age and size how often are you going to take your pup to the bathroom right if they're awake you've got a puppy four to eight pounds it might be every 15 minutes hey debbie if um if you've got a puppy that's got a bigger bladder like Bentley, he was, gosh, I want to say he was eight or it's been seven years, eight or 12 pounds right at eight weeks. So he was able to hold his bladder for an hour while he was awake. And quickly I was, he was left alone for up to two hours by week one. And that was, that's typical for an average size pup that doesn't have Jardia. This is a healthy pup that um, is able to hold their tummy their bladder. So here we got the morning routine. So 6 a.m. It consists of waking up, which is taking the pup out of their crate, let's just say, or any kind of safe room that you have. Potty first, then they have an activity. Now that can be training, like you're doing some, some obedience training with your pup, but they're using your their food to go over some of the training. Then finishing up with some kind of interactive feeder. Then they go back to potty and then nap time. Now, this routine for a puppy at eight weeks old can take about 30 minutes and then they're back in bed. <laughs> like, yeah. And maybe you're adding 15 minutes every single week is typically how we do things. So we'll go through a routine and dog is back in bed after 30 minutes. And every week we'll add 15 minutes. So the following week, that routine takes 45 minutes and then an hour and then an hour 15. Progress at a rate that your dog can keep up with. The nap time, time, go very, for it. If you have a very small puppy, right, you're getting a mini or a micro or a toy, um, you're gonna make sure to always have your eyes on your dog and you might have to speed this schedule up. They may take more naps, they may take less naps depending on their size and their potty schedule. So just remember that this is just an outline and you guys are going to substitute your times based on the breed and the size of your dog. So if we take this, this was Coco's schedule. Coco was um, eight mini? weeks when we, yeah, she was a mini Bernadoodle, but she was also, um, she was kind of on the bigger side <laughs> compared yeah, to some of the tiny. Yeah. Mini. <laughs> so she would stay awake for 45 minutes. So if we go wake up, potty, activity, food enrichment, potty that took 45 minutes and then she was asleep for two hours and then back up at nine o'clock same thing wake up potty activity this time it was a field trip she'd go in the car she'd go for a walk around the neighborhood of course she's not vaccinated so she was carried right carried in the neighborhood and then a activity of play back to potty and then back to nap time so six, nine, 12, three, five, and eight, that was her routine. And then at night, it was every two hours, the first night and every three hours. And by the end of her first week, she was sleeping five hours. And that's a typical routine. So this is just a guideline. Like Julie said, the smaller dogs are going to go out more frequently, right? And they're going to have, they're not maybe going to, not going to stay asleep as long. So if you'd like a copy of this, drop it in the chat. Uh, you can just put 
put something like copy of daily schedule and we'll uh, basically click your name and send it right to you. All right, let's go back to our presentation and we will. And like I said, that schedule and the routine is key. Consistency, consistency. You can potty train and crate train your puppy in one week. Yep. You, the, the pet owner, you guys, not just us, you can potty and crate train your dog in one week. You must be consistent. You must follow a schedule, but you have every capability to make your life a lot easier if you guys are hard on that routine. So let's go over the potty training routine. You want to go through the same door and take your pup potty to the same potty station. You can build something on a patio, a deck. You can take them into a bark box, a box full of bark. Uh, just find a safe place where your dog can go potty. So this was created in a laundry room over in one of our clients' houses. It's just a patch of real grass. You can get this on Amazon. Uh, same house, but we also did a patch of grass. This is real grass again on a deck. We also use fake grass patches that I have upstairs on my deck. So the larger the dog, the larger the potty station needs to be. Now, going over the through the same exact door each time. If you want to bell ring your teach your dog to ring a bell to tell you that they need to go to the bathroom to alert you, then you're going to want to add a bell to this routine. So routine is everything. Bringing your dog, um, setting up a potty station would be your favorite, your dog's favorite toy, a trash can, poop bags, enzyme, enzyme cleaner, wipes. Having all that ready right by the potty station is going to help set you up for success. You're using treats or a toy to reinforce this every time your dog goes potty outside and you're going to go with them. You're going to bring them on leash at the beginning or you're going to carry if they're a young pup. If they miss the spot by a little, don't say anything. The last thing you want to do is reprimand your dog for going out, uh, going outside or going anywhere. Um, you want to make sure that your dog is not afraid of you. Remember, you're still building that relationship. So as soon as they do go potty in the correct spot, reinforce that. So while they're going potty and you see the pee going down into your spot, then you want to make sure that you cue or say the cue that you would like to use later on. Setting a timer is going to help set you up for success. Young pups that are um, on the smaller side, every 15 minutes and maybe progress every five minutes from there, right? So set your timer. Don't wait for your dog to alert you because all you're going to do is teach your dog to whine and bark. Be proactive. So anything you want to add to that? No, I do want to call attention to one of the 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 visions on in the video, um, we put the water bowl right next to where yeah. your dog is going to go outside because we want to create that drive of refill, go empty or go empty and then refill. But it constantly kind of points them in that direction. Love that. They get a little water and then they go, oh yeah, I got to go to the bathroom because puppies are goldfish and they will forget until that exact moment and then they drop and go potty. So if we can create that attention if we can create that drive towards the door towards the exit we want to do it with every opportunity that we can yes good point so yeah you saw that the water station was set right by the door that is used to, to have the dog go potty socialization checklist now when you first bring your puppy home you have between the time you bring them home all the way up to 12 weeks for our standard or smaller pups and up to 14 weeks for the larger breeds uh, to get them to really feel okay with some of the things that you're going to socialize them with, meaning the touch, the smell, the surfaces, meeting different kinds of people. And we say meeting, we're seeing from afar. It doesn't have to mean that they have to come and touch them. But you want to make sure that you, whatever is going to be in your dog's world, they're exposed to in this socialization stage. Because remember, they're making decisions right now. Now, after this socialization stays and they go into the next stage of their life, they've pretty much decided whether things are safe or unsafe. If they haven't been exposed to it, it's not safe for them. So what that looks like is a dog that backs up, walks away, disengages, avoids, barks, lunges, right? 
all of the body language that we're, um, we're describing usually comes from a dog saying, uh-uh, nope, oh, nope, not, not yet, right? Too close, that kind of thing. So using the socialization checklist that you see here, you want to do a really good job of getting your dog exposed to these things. And you can do it even if your dog is not vaccinated, right? Public events, the beach, the park, restaurants, coffee, patios, seminars, street fairs, schools, you can pick up your pup and expose them that way. Remember the sight of something 20 feet away is fine. Sounds, Julie, how do we expose puppies to sounds? I know a lot of breeders are doing it now, but how, how can we recommend? YouTube, so grab yes. your phone, grab your Bluetooth speaker, you can hook it up to your TV, play things that you don't always have the access to, right? I don't have a baby at this point in my life, but I still need for my puppies to know what the sound of a crying baby sounds like so that they don't bark in response to a baby crying. That would be very embarrassing, I would think, out in public. So sounds thunder. In California, we don't have a lot of thunder, so making sure that your dogs hear that early and often when they're puppies. Firework, we're coming up on the 4th of July and we have an entire um, ebook that we're gonna roll out for the fireworks, but making sure that they're not scared um, or shaking or they feel the need to run away from these big sounds that are going to be in their life, whether we want them to or not, they're going to hear fireworks, thunder, barking dogs. So having them hear that early yeah. while they're maybe playing or we're eating or just kind of ignoring, hearing it in the background makes it no big deal. And that right. way when they hear it, they can just go back to living their life. I know a lot of with a lot of the Aussies that we work with, Julie, the skateboards is a big one. So if you can expose your puppy to something that um, that we've had experience having struggles with later on, the sound of a skateboard and the sight of a skateboard, just grab a skateboard, bring it into the house like you would your vacuum cleaner. Right. Bicycles just, as well. Bicycles and scooters. If you yeah. I mean, any kind of playground area that you can go to and just watch kids running around with your puppy. They certainly don't need to come up and pet the puppy, but hang out with them, sit on the bench and say, hey, look, there's kids playing. And that kind of stimulation will also wear your puppy out so you can come home and have a nice puppy nap and quiet time. You get a lot more stuff done in the meantime. So when you're when you're creating a socialization or exposure experience, you want to make sure that you're really patient about what it is and, and letting the dog interact with it on their own. So you never want to set your puppy on anything that you're trying to expose them to. So this was a little obstacle course with Darla, the Boston um, over here in the kitchen. And we just laid out a bunch of things and there's our boxer, uh, yeah, there's an aluminum. So like a cookie sheet, a yoga mat, unstable surfaces, a positive or neutral experience is what you're going for. Pull out the vacuum cleaner and just let them sniff around and just check things out on their own pace. You'll see a lot of breeders now are using like the jungle gyms. This is the exact same thing. You can do this with the sound of fireworks from afar, right? While they're going through something fun like this. This also helps us, especially if you live in the city, remember that we don't always have grass. We don't always have an ideal situation for our puppies to go potty on. So dogs that have never felt, you know, wet cement or have never touched sand, they are gonna be very hesitant, not only to walk on that, but to maybe go to the bathroom in the future. So doing an indoor obstacle course like this, make sure that they are adaptable, they're flexible, and it makes exploring and adventuring with them so much easier down the line. Yeah, you're gonna do something like this with almost everything that you can possibly imagine. Create a safe way to expose your puppy to things. And as you, when you need to go outside and expose them to other environments that you do it safely. All right, exercise and play. Now, when you first start out with your puppy, you wanna make sure that play and exercise is something that is always joyful and fun. Here we have on the left is a client of ours that is working on hide and seek. So she's creating a positive exposure to finding mom, right? So she's playing a little game of hide and seek. She's calling the dog's name. The dog's coming over. She's tossing some of the dog's food on the floor and then running to a new spot. 
this is fun for the puppy. It's fun for the pet parent. And you're creating a dog that wants to recall, come find you, right? So positive exposure to the name, positive exposure to finding. And on the right, Julie, human play. So important. So we all know how important it is for our puppies to play with other puppies, but we want to make sure that you and your puppy are bonding, that you become their best friend. So they're not so focused on what every other dog is doing. They're responding to you, your cues, your attention, your love. So you're going to get down on the floor. Adam did a great job in this video. He's using his hands really low and tracing the floor. He's making sure to do little bounces and then stop and wait for the puppy to come after him. He's moving as if another dog would to teach Darla what puppy play looks like, right? What appropriate body language is because we don't want to wait for another dog to define that for your dog. So this is no rules. You can see she's barking. She's bouncing. She's being a little mouth. Oh my God, that's Willow. That's Willow. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So this is one of the dogs who, who has come back into our training program almost a year later. And she loves this kind of stuff with her new family. Being on her back and having your belly rubbed while you're kind of crawling around. You can talk. You can watch her body language as we're playing. So I'm learning how she likes to play, what she finds engaging and motivating instead of just throwing her around the room and expecting her to, to want to wrestle. Not all dogs like that. So some dogs are chase dogs. Some dogs are wrestle dogs. Some dogs are fetch dogs. We want to meet them where they are and work on our relationship that way. Beautiful. As we move on to the alone time, I talked about a little earlier that creating the place that you want your dog to hang out, even when given the opportunity to go anywhere else. So using management, which we're going to jump into in just a second, is going to help prepare or create that safe space, right? But when management disappears, you, what you get is a dog that likes to hang out in their spot. So in this bottom left hand video, there's Bentley. He is in his spot. And this X pen is open. And this dog bandit has, I mean, can leave at any time, but chooses to stay in a safe space. All I did was open the X pen and blocked off, of course, the living room. But you see that because of the routine that we developed early on, he still hangs out there even when given the opportunity to leave. And you know, so, in your experience, what happens when we don't give our puppies enough alone time? What happens later in life when we haven't incorporated this into their schedule regularly? So the top right-hand corner is what we're doing here is, is preventing separation anxiety. So when a dog is not comfortable, now when you first bring your puppy home, they're not used to being alone. They've had litter mates, they've had their mom, they've probably had you know, the guardian of some kind there. So they've never had the experience of being alone. And then when you bring your puppy home and you're like, well, I got to go take a shower. I've got to put my puppy up for some reason. Dog is left alone for the very first time. And the instinct of most animals is when they're left alone, they better scream bloody murder and have somebody come searching for them. Search a rescue, right? Because that puppy's feeling like really vulnerable. Something bad might happen because they're left alone. So it is something that you have to help the dog be comfortable with. So this right on the right hand side video is how to create that. How do you teach your dog to be okay left alone? Now, when they're not comfortable, it sounds like bloody murder, right? The dog is screaming, crying, barking, jumping, doing everything that they possibly can to say, please don't leave me. Come back and get me. Oh, and it kills you. It really, it, the, especially yeah. if you live in an apartment, your neighbors are going to think that you're actually hurting a puppy when really this is just their very last resort. They are just going to scream until something happens. And if nothing happens, well, they might try other things like climbing over fences or even chewing up other things. So this is how we work on that a little bit at a time. Yeah. So... When you first bring your puppy home, you don't want to bail on them. You're, you are staying really close to them, but maybe there's a barrier. 
So that's where like, I'll have a crate and I'll put my fingers in the crate and say, I'm right here, but you just can't, you know, like having one step would be like, you can't touch me because remember with their litter mates are constantly on top of each other. They're, you know, they can touch them at any time. So just creating a little bit of a barrier is the very, very first step. So here is like the second or third step is I'm giving this puppy something to chew on that's heavy enough where the dog can't pick it up and follow me as I walk around the house. So moving away from your puppy, whether it's just a foot or two feet. So I, I make something that's frozen or I'll grab something from the freezer or something heavy. So this was the dog's interactive feeder. She was 10 weeks old and we're working on being alone so that I can actually leave the room. So this is me call, we call it working the room. <laughs> and uh, there, I guess that has a lot of different a meanings. A lot of different meanings, yeah. I never thought about that. <laughs> working the room is that she's been given something to do while I move around and see, she can see me and smell me, of course, but she chooses to stay put instead of following. See that? So you'll see her kind of look up at me and even say, where are you going? Okay. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. She's actually got a positive experience um, with me leaving. Because if you do this kind of routine quite a bit, when your puppy starts to see whatever that is that you're giving them, they might say, oh, I'm being left alone. Awesome. I get this popsicle. So, all right, let me move on. So management, Julie, touch on the topic of prevention and examples of management. Yeah, so all of the things that we see in older dogs that it, it takes quite a bit of time for behavior modification to fix these things. So pulling on leash potty accidents, resource guarding, very, very dangerous, jumping and jumping on people and pushing them around, chewing and biting and separation anxiety, all of these things we can help prevent long term if we're utilizing management and management i tell people is the easiest way to train a puppy it is the no frills no money no no problem way to treat train your dog how to not get into these situations you have to be very consistent but crates X pens, tethering, meaning having a harness and a leash and kind of tying your puppy to you so there's nowhere else they can wander off and have an accident. Using baby gates, right? If you don't want your dog in the kitchen, don't let your puppy in the kitchen. Using muzzles, this is especially important for dogs who have a bite history or who may be very scared at vets or groomers. Closing the curtains. I know in California, it's absolutely beautiful all the time. We love <laughs> to have our doors open. But if your dog is constantly running to the window and barking, we're going to create a bad pattern. We're going to create a pattern that frustrates us and our neighbors. So close your curtains just for a little while. Management is a temporary solution that we then incorporate training to fix. So crossing the street, making sure that you're Puppies understand um, you don't always have to meet another dog head on. You don't always have to be pet and touched by people who want to pet and touch you. We wouldn't do that with our children. We don't shove our children up to strangers and say, hey, go hug that guy. So we should really take into account our dog's fear and wants in that situation as well. And management is going to save you a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of frustration mm -hmm. if you're utilizing it every day. And one of the key things to remember with a puppy is that it will pass. It does pass, yeah. It will pass. So um, I'm watching some of the comments in our Aussie Doodle uh, group. You know, does anyone else's puppy uh, nip and bite like crazy, right? Crocodile teeth. <laughs> yes, they all have sharp Everything. teeth for a reason. Like they all do that. Yeah. Now, how do you prevent it? You use management. If it hurts to have your puppy's mouth on your hands, then don't give them access to your hands. That's as simple. I mean, it sounds super simple and it is that simple because stealing clothes and socks and shoes, chewing up your nice furniture. Don't give your brand new puppy who doesn't know what nice furniture is access to that furniture from the beginning. Yeah. 
So prevention is key. Management, we talked about it just earlier. Here are some examples. So on the left, this is three dogs in the same home. There's Bentley in the far end. He gets full access to the house. We had a new Boston that was here. She's in a crate. The other one's in an X-Pen. The other one has full access to the house. This is how you can manage. So preventing dog fights, preventing resource guarding, right? All of that stuff can be prevented by using management. Same with kids. If, if you don't set up management early on with a brand new puppy and a young toddler, all you're going to develop is uh, your toddler might be afraid of the puppy or the puppy might be reactive to the toddler. You've got to create that right from the beginning. There is a, you can look, you can see, but there should not be a lot of touch going on when a puppy has super sharp teeth and doesn't, they're still learning themselves, right? All it takes is a toddler to pull that puppy's ears or tail or try to sit on them to create a response that might be life-threatening for that puppy later on. Absolutely. And, and puppies and babies don't have impulse control. We can't say, okay, bud, I need you to be really, really careful when you're in the puppy's space. That's really yeah. not fair to the toddler or to the puppy, right? They're yeah. babies. Yeah. So it's up to us to make sure that we're creating that management. We're reinforcing it and that they still understand they can have as much fun with the puppy. We're just going to keep them safe. We're going to keep them on leash. We're going to keep them behind an X pen so that nothing Nothing, nothing happens. We are not saying that puppies will be aggressive to babies, but why even take the chance of them even knocking them over on the way to yeah. their food? You wouldn't, let, you wouldn't let you have your toddler play with knives, even right. though it might, nothing might, bad might not happen, but you wouldn't do it. So here's how management works. You set up management. You prevent any unwanted behaviors. Step two, you train your dog to do the preferred behavior. So for example, in this right hand corner video, I would prefer the boxer to lay in a dog bed every time my toddler is out walking in the kitchen. That would be my preferred behavior. Step three, we can then remove management because the dog's got it is trained. We just have to train the child not to go into the dog bed with a, with a puppy. But uh, that's at least at least the dog is trained, right? So management is not forever but it is the very, very, very first step in training. All right, so let's just review everything that we talked about real quickly. Step one, set up management. Step two, establish a routine. Step three, create trust, right? We talked about hand feeding. Step four, use your puppy's motivation to teach behaviors that can be put on cue. And that's basically learning the vocabulary. And here are some of the basic things that you want to start off with when you've got a young pup. One, how to take food when being approached. Whether you're sitting down next to your pup and your hand is approaching, so your association with your hand is a positive association, so take food from your hand would be one of the very, very first things you want to be able to establish. Follow you, right? So if the dog follows you, you want to like reward that because that's going to end up being recall later on come when called. Targeting, again, and your dog follows your hand, so you're not having to put food in your hand to teach behaviors, right? To teach an X, like a sit or a down, you don't have to put food in your hand. You can simply say, follow my hand or follow this object. Use management to teach what you want your puppy to do instead. You want to ride off the bad teacher dog to be alone so you can get a shower in or go to the bathroom in peace. And Remember to capture wanted behavior. You're going to reinforce that. Reward any positive behaviors that you are looking to establish as wanted. So laying down, sit, calmness, waiting, eye contact, all those kind of things you want to make sure that you're constantly rewarding. Potty outside. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Anything that's, Anything that you, that's not inside the house. Yeah. And so lastly, this is, um, this is, if you are struggling with anything besides, this was the basic workshop on how, why, and all of that. If you're struggling with anything specific, you are welcome to give us a call and set up what we call just a strategy call. It's totally free. 
and you just call that number. I guess I put 877 twice. I was really adamant about putting 877, but it's just 877-428-8285. Give us a call and we will set up a call and find out what your struggles are. Now, every week in your group, we are putting in what we call a trainer's tip Tuesday. And it's where we're breaking up short tips, right? So the tips are in your, if you're in your Aussie Doodle group page, you'll have, let's see, it's under files. Nope, it's not files. It's under guides. That's what it's called now. Guides is where we're putting together each of the little topics. So, so far we have multi-drug sensitivity, MDR1, a gene test. That was guide one. Guide two, jumping on guest in the home. Guide three, understanding why your Aussie Doodle doesn't come when called. Guide four, Aussie, Aussie Doodle puppy chewing and nipping. Guide five, teaching your Aussie Doodle to walk on a loose leash. So we're going in there and we're presenting tips for you to be able to just um, get some more understanding of what you might do. And hopefully that's helpful. This is all free resources for you guys. If you need extra help, I'm going to put that number down in here again. And you're going to probably get Julie, who's going to give you some tips and help. Uh, we have a puppy group that you can join for free. If you'd like to see live videos of us going through like what we might do in a socialization event. While I pull that number, Julie, uh, yeah. just add on to anything else we might need to say. In those puppy groups, we also, so Yo and I personally raise up to probably 50, 60 puppies in our own houses a year, not ours, but for clients. And we help build that routine. And, and we also experience those frustrations. It's a very real thing. So if you want to watch us, you know, listen to puppies cry and, and help each other get through it, if we need to um, come up with a new way of feeding because your dog's not particularly food motivated or, or toy motivated. We go live in that group and we work with a lot of different breeds, um, especially on potty routines and the bell training and, and what to do when things um, get in your puppy's mouth. All of this is a daily question that we get and we go through this on a daily basis. So please feel free to reach out because if you have the question, I promise someone else does as well. And it's, it's important to feel like you're not alone in this. I know that uh, it can feel a little isolating because you have to have eyes on your puppy all the time, but we are here to help you. We're here to connect and we're here to make sure that you get the dog that you've always dreamed of in the next 10 to 15 years. All right, guys, that's a wrap. That was all we just wanted to come in here and drop in a workshop just to give you some guidance. Again, this was recorded. You can, you can watch it later on. You can share it with your family and friends. If you need more help, there's a number. It's a free phone consult with, um, and we can go through any of the helps that you might need. Also steer you into a group if you need more training. So that's it. Julie, thank you so much for joining and bye guys. Yay, thanks so much.